this is not exactly a sequel to the uh, terrific program that Alexandra did uh, a couple of months ago on the 1918 flu epidemic in uh, in Quincy, but it kind of got inspired by that. And uh, we sort of began from the point of thinking about the fact that John Adams was president during uh, both, uh, during a number of the yellow fever epidemics in Philadelphia in the 1790s and uh, thought there might be something there. And before we knew what we were doing, we found a heck of a lot because one thing led to another. So we're going to take you really from the 1790s uh, up to uh, well, at least 1989 uh, before, this is, uh, before this is over. So we should probably get going. Uh, let us begin by talking about what yellow fever is um, consensus on its origin is that it's from Africa. The most likely date for the earliest Western Hemisphere epidemic would be 1645 in the West Indies. Uh, the first outbreak in the future United States, uh, Ms. Elliott, would you like to talk about that one? Sure, yeah. Um, so as you can see on the slide there, um, Boston is actually one of the first uh, epidemic outbreaks that occurs in, uh, the, in North America, really. There were a few earlier um, that are suspected to maybe be yellow fever, but they could, might not be. Uh, one in 1668 in New York and then one in 1669 in Philadelphia. But the first uh, confirmed epidemic of yellow fever occurred here or nearby in Boston um, in 1693. Um, now, the last epidemic, as you can see up on the screen there, occurred in New Orleans in 1905. This um, corresponded to uh, the virus's discovery as being mosquito-borne, which I believe will correspond to the next slide. I believe so. We're going to find the first, the little creature responsible for all of this. Yes, that little, tiny little nuisance uh, that causes so many troubles for people. Um, but on top of being just plain old annoying, uh, turns out these little critters also carry deadly diseases, or so we discovered as, um, or so Walter Reed discovered in 1905 when it was finally confirmed uh, positively that mosquitoes do carry diseases. Now, in terms of yellow fever, a very particular type of uh, mosquito, breed of mosquito, uh, is the sort of preferred carrier. That's being the, and apologize for my pronunciation here, the uh, Aedes aegypti. Um, it's a particular family of mosquito that uh, just happens to be one of the best carriers for this particular type of disease. Um, the other thing about that is it also gets even more particular than that. Uh, it is only the female of the species feeds, so it has to be a female mosquito. And then for it tr to transmit the disease, it has to bite someone who already has the disease. It has to bite them within the first three or four days of they having been infected with the disease. And then it has to incubate the disease inside itself for about two weeks before it is going to transmit it by biting somebody else. So it's not surprising that people took a long time to figure this out. Um, and that gets us to why it was so frightening for people. It wasn't necessarily the most deadly disease if you just counted up the number of people who died in, uh, you know, in total numbers, but it had a particular kind of terror to it. First of all, because it was mosquito borne, it tended to be in cities, it tended to be in populated areas because the mosquito had to get it, move on to somebody else, give it to them, and, and so forth. So populated areas were more likely. The uh, disease was particularly nasty in its uh, manifestations. And um, Alexander, do you want to do the, the kind of course of the disease? Sure, I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take the graphic details here. Um, so in terms of the progression of yellow fever, it is typically an incubation period of about three to six days. Um, and then after which the first symptoms will appear. Now you can kind of see on the left-hand side of your screen, a very handsome looking young man 
full of life and probably just got a mosquito bite a couple days ago. But after a few days, he starts to look closer to the second picture there uh, and has very high fever, is starting to feel a little bit nauseous. And then after that, he's sort of feeling some chills as well. After that, we'll start to feel some aching muscles in his back. Um, and uh, this is usually... Uh, or this, this is, of course, not very discernible for many other diseases that you might have. That could just be a very bad flu. But um, after that, you will start to see some of the more severe symptoms. Um, it, in about 15% of the cases, the fever will come back after it has started to get better, uh, at which point you will start to have or victims will start to have abdominal pain and liver damage. And this is where yellow fever actually gets its name is from, as you can see in that third picture, jaundice. So the liver has started to take on damage. Some of uh, the chemicals that the liver usually breaks down for the body uh, is starting to build up in the skin. And thus you get that sort of jaundiced yellow color in the eyes, especially, but also in the skin. And this is, of course, a symptom of the liver damage. And then um, this is usually a very bad sign. Um, about 50% of those who who develop jaundice uh, would go on to the more severe um, uh, symptoms and would usually lead to death. And more severe symptoms, you would uh, there would be bleeding, um, usually from uh, the mouth the, and the nose, then progressively from the eyes, um, and eventually uh, there would be internal bleeding. And so you would there would be uh, it, some of the different names in different languages for this disease are uh, translate to essentially black vomit which is um, characteristic of the internal bleeding. Uh, there's also, of course, quite a lot of delirium. It is, to say the least, a very graphic disease. Um, it would be quite harrowing to witness someone that you love or just a, a total stranger going through these symptoms. It is, uh, it is quite a horror, to say the least. Because it is only mosquito-borne, that's the only way really it gets transmitted. Uh, the assumption is that uh, in Africa, it moved from primate to uh, human by a mosquito biting a monkey and then turning around and biting a human. But because of that, um, to keep going the way it does, it is dependent on new people coming in uh, who are potentially already carrying the disease. So it is a byproduct of trade. And then in a very uh, distinct and very real kind of way, it is also um, a byproduct of slavery uh, because obviously the human cargo being brought on the Middle Passage from, uh, from Africa uh, to the Western Hemisphere was a just prime material for uh, any mosquitoes that happen to be uh, stowaways on, on the boats. Um, so in many sorts of ways, it uh, not only struck physical terror and concern for people, but it also, even when people weren't making, weren't, didn't have the information to make all the connections, I think on some level, um, it struck their subconscious it struck their their kind of imaginative life their, their kind of dream life and that's part of what we're going to be looking at tonight as well as the actual progress of the disease um this is actually the wharf at philadelphia where the uh 1793 epidemic that we're going to be talking about in a minute uh actually began there were epidemics uh throughout the 19th century in all sorts of uh, cities, particularly south of the Mason-Dixon line, but on numerous occasions, including the 1790s, um, as far north as New York. New York got hit several times, when, uh, and there would often be simultaneous epidemics. But because of the nature of the transmission, it was always a series of epidemics happening at the same time, rather than a pandemic, such as the situation that we're, we're having to deal with today. Um, so, it really enters our American consciousness and really kind of gets underway in Philadelphia, where the decade of the 1790s is uh, a decade in which yellow fever recurs almost yearly. Uh, 1793 is highlighted in red because it is by far the worst year. Um, and but it continues uh, really in past 1799. We could just keep the dates going because it, it 
went you know much longer than that but these are the ones that are immediately also tie us to our native son john adams because of course john adams is um, vice president in 1793 here's an artist rendering of uh, george washington's first inauguration with adams here uh to his right adams is vice president when the 1793 epidemic strikes However, he is not in Philadelphia. Neither he nor Abigail are in Philadelphia. The epidemic begins in uh, August of 1793. Uh, it officially gets called in around August 19th, but probably people were starting to get sick by August 1st. Um, Adams and Abigail had left uh, Philadelphia and come back here to Quincy as early as March, and they simply stayed away until November. Um, However, uh, a number of, of the other offices, uh, Washington was there when it began, and uh, Jefferson was uh, living out in the suburbs just beyond the city limits. Alexander Hamilton was there. And most importantly, um, the man who was in the middle of dealing with the crisis was Adams's good friend uh, and co-signer with Adams of the Declaration of Independence, Dr. Benjamin Rush possibly the most distinguished uh, medical man of his day. Um, Rush threw himself into this with absolute manic devotion, uh, seeing uh, 140, 120 patients a day when it was at, at its height, uh, going without sleep, working around the clock. Um, with what we would have to say is somewhat mixed results. Um, Alexander, do you want to talk about, how do you feel, do you want to do something about the different theories of how to treat the sure. disease? Different things yeah, about I can it? talk about that. Yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, the different theories about how to actually confront the disease and how to actually treat it, um, there were two main schools of thought, one of, who, one of which was headed by sort of some of the more um, established or some of the other establishment doctors of Philadelphia and then the other by Dr. Benjamin Rush and some of his colleagues. Um, the first uh, one being um, headed up by uh, some of the city doctors were sort of more emulating palliative care. So uh, really influent or uh, uh, um, emphasizing bed rest, fluids and nutrition, the sorts of um, advice that you might see for a flu or a cold today um, as being the most useful way to treat a disease, essentially uh, give the body enough uh, nutrition and rest to be able to uh, naturally fight it off itself. Um, and then Dr. Benjamin Rush, however, was looking at the severity of this disease and was thinking, well, it must need a very aggressive treatment to be able to deal with it. And so he was advocating for treatments such as bloodletting and purging, so purging being more or less exactly what it sounds like, um, and really um, push this very, very, uh, push these types of care very, very strongly. And in fact, Rush's methods became the standard for, you know, treating fevers for roughly the next 50 years. And I believe that um, this was even some of the, the same methods that were used to treat Washington at the end of his life for a fever that he had towards the end of his life. Yeah, the, the man who bled Washington actually, I don't, I don't remember his name, but he was actually in Philadelphia treating patients during the, during the epidemic. Um, and Rush really took it to an extreme. He found when he got very frustrated when nothing, as the cases just kept mounting and he'd gone through all the classic works, he went to a, a text, a more obscure text, a, a, really advocated extreme, extreme purging and, and, ble and uh, bloodletting, uh, which was complicated by the fact that they thought that there was twice as much blood in the human body as there actually is. So uh, it, it was really quite, quite extreme. And that became the first really big controversy, what, what Alexander was describing. The, the two controversies were what was causing it. There was a theory that it was just like rot. It was just spontaneously growing out of rotting particularly a particularly pile of rotting coffee on the wharf and other people claiming that people were bringing that it, they would had to come in with people there were refugees a uh, number of french refugees who were fleeing a slave revolt in santo domingo who had, who had been arriving in considerable numbers and in fact because it obviously cannot spontaneously generate it, it clearly 
probably did come in uh, on either the refugees or on another boat. Um, so there was that dispute, and then there was the palliative care versus the uh, versus the bleeding and purging uh, care approach. In either way, uh, it wasn't going well. Uh, the, the cases just kept mounting up. There, uh, people were dying. The social structure was beginning to collapse. Uh, the almshouse refused to take in yellow fever victims because they were afraid they were simply going to infect all the, uh, the what healthy residents there were in the almshouse of the paupers that were, that were normally living there. The uh, a number of wealthy people, including uh, and well-to-do people who could leave, did, including some of the medical community. Um, the overseers and the guardians of the poor, a number of the senior people of that left, leaving only young people, some of the younger members. They began to get sick themselves. Things were going uh, bad, from bad to worse. The guardians of the poor finally decided they had to create a lazaretto, a, a place to put yellow fever victims um, and only yellow fever victims. And they choose this uh, building on the outskirts of town. Uh, this, the caption says Hamilton residence. It has nothing to do with Alexander Hamilton. Um, this was owned by a man named William Hamilton. It was called Bush Hill. And in fact, it had been the home uh, in Philadelphia of John and Abigail Adams. They had rented it during the first two years of Adams as vice presidency, but had uh, gone elsewhere the last, the last couple of years. So the Guardian simply appropriated the building. They never asked Mr. Hamilton anything, uh, any questions uh, or any permission. They just took it. Uh, because it had been, he had left. He had been an absentee landlord, um, and um, it became a notorious, nightmarish place in about three or four weeks because there was no level of professional care. Um, at this point, uh, Rush, in the opinion of the m most, the, the sort of standard historian of this of the Philadelphia epidemic, even though he is probably performing the wrong procedure in trying to cure people and clearly bleeding people is not, we know, a good idea, um, is actually providing a certain amount of stability because he is staying, even though he is working himself to a frazzle. He winds up, uh, his sister who lives with him gets the disease and dies. A number of his young medical ass assistants, his young doctors get the disease. A number of them die. People, you know, personal servants of him, of his die. Eventually he himself um, gets the fever and is prostrate. Is actually flat on his back, despite the fact that he keeps trying to get up and get to work uh, during the absolute height of the disease. But that in itself is a source of comfort and stability just on the basis of uh, the amazing reputation that the man has. What does happen, though, is the mayor of uh, Philadelphia, who's really kind of been abandoned by the governor, um, begins to uh, decide that he's got to do something. Uh, society is collapsing. The civil government has really kind of collapsed. He turns to assemble a committee of um, leading men or men who are willing to stay of whom Stephen Girard, the banker whom we're looking at now, is the uh, kind of natural leader. They really wind up only being about 12 of them. And as of September 15th, they really take over um, care of the city. And in a kind of major uh, action, they bring adequate medical care to Bush Hill, to the Lazaretto House. And it is not um, in Russia's style, uh, Rush's style. Uh, Gerard gives it to a, uh, gives the job to a French emigre physician named Jean Deves, who is very much a, the French school of treatment is much more palliative care, gentle treatment. So that becomes the treatment at Bush Hill. But as this group kind of spreads out, they begin to introduce some element of stability into the city um, at the same, uh, even as the disease reaches its height. They are also not an elite group. Uh, the man who works most closely and does the most besides uh, the banker, Stephen Girard, is a man named Peter Helm, who is a cooper. He makes, he's a barrel maker. He's, a, he's an artisan. 
but between the two of them, they work, uh, they work together and with about 10 other guys, keep the, keep the city going. Um, but even before September uh, 15th, and these men have stepped forward, another part of the community has stepped forward, which is the free African community, uh, led by two men, the Reverend Absalom Jones, who we see here, and the Reverend Richard Allen, who we see here. Absalom Jones is a uh, Episcopal minister. Uh, Richard Allen is a, a Methodist minister. Absalom Jones will become the first uh, ordained uh, Episcopal priest in the United States. Absalom Jones will become the first uh, Methodist minister, uh, Methodist bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in America. But at the time, they are building their own uh, African congregations because they have been uh, unceremoniously treated at the, the white Episcopal Church. At the, uh, they've been busy with that when the epidemic strikes. They come to Clarkson and offer their services on September 5th um, and become absolutely vital in uh, saving the city. The, the African Free Society, uh, of which they are the leaders, uh, takes on all the jobs that need to be done, the carting of the dead, the, the cleaning, the, dis, the burying, everything that needs to be, uh, to be done. Everything, they put everything on hold. They are, they are encouraged to do this in part by Dr. Rush. Also in part because Rush has a erroneous but very widespread belief that, Afri that um, Africans are immune to the disease which may come from the possibility that at some point more Africans uh, had experienced the disease in their young years and survived and therefore had an immunity. Um, this is really an important part of the story because after the epidemic is over and everybody begins um, telling their story and grinding their ax, Matthew Carey, who in many other respects is a very admirable character, he's a Irish immigrant, he was a rebel in Ireland who had to get out of Ireland and came to, came to Philadelphia, um, publishes this uh, booklet. Uh, he is a, by trade a printer and publisher. Um, I won't read the whole title because we've only got an hour and a half, um, but um, it attempts to describe what happened during the plague in Philadelphia. And at one point he criticizes the African-Americans for profiteering. Uh, Reverend uh, Jones and Reverend Allen are, decide they are not going to sit for this, and they publish a refutation, making this one of the earliest African American uh, publications and, and writings uh, in our history, or at least within the national history, uh, in which they are very, very point by point uh, take Carey's accusations apart. Um, Few other things happened. I, I, well, actually, Alexander, you, uh, anything on this that you would like to add to to that part of the story? Um, so, just uh, kind of going back to a little bit about um, the African American community being considered immune to the disease. This actually dates back to a um, some observations that Rush had read um, from a yellow fever epidemic in. One of the Carolinas, I'm blanking on exactly which one, um, in which it was observed that slaves from Africa um, did have more immunity exactly for the reasons that you said. Now, this rumor, essentially, of course, does not carry over to the free communities in that, uh, that were born and grew up in North America. They did not have those immunities since those immunities are not generational. They do not pass down to subsequent generations. Um, so this be, this rumor about um, African Americans being uh, immune to yellow fever um, is widespread and becomes act quite pernicious um, in the latter in the of the middle half of uh, the 19th century. So around the time of the Civil War, you really do get. We'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but that does that comes up again, and even after it has that rumor has been debunked, it still continues to be um, used. Mm. Um, meanwhile, uh, a few other things have been happening. Uh, Alexander Hamilton has actually gotten yellow fever in the middle of all of this, um, and obviously survives, as we all know. Um, and he, after that, does leave the city um, and, and seek. Uh, 
a safer place. Washington leaves the city on September 10th, which winds up being somewhat controversial, although he had been he, he had done this every year uh, that he had been a president and then in Philadelphia. He had left around that time to go back to Mount Vernon. And he did it with some reluctance, but felt there were real overriding family needs for why he had to leave. Uh, nevertheless, it did not exactly instill a lot of confidence in, in uh, the public. Um, John and Abigail's son, Thomas Boylston, is actually in Philadelphia this summer studying for the law with Jared Ingersoll. And he stays for a fair amount of time and then, and then does uh, leave and go out to the country. Uh, and the one that really is kind of, I'm going to take the minute to indulge in this, um, there is a, um, let's see if I have you, if I can remember the name. Yeah, John Todd. There's a young Quaker named John Todd who has married a beautiful young woman named Dolly Payne, and they're living in Philadelphia. He has sent Dolly and who is pregnant and their young child out to safety. He has remained in the city. John Todd um, becomes ill, is sure he's going to die. And against all his better judgment, because he loves Dolly so much, he goes to try and see her one last time, gets there, expires on the doorstep saying, I just had to see you one more time. Dolly does become ill, although of course she did not really catch it from her husband because he can't. Um, the baby dies, the newborn baby dies, but the, the older child survives. Dolly and her mother go back to Philadelphia. Uh, the, the mother begins taking in boarders in the house. Um, they begin to attract attention. Aaron Burr, this is you know long after that, but Aaron Burr notices Dolly and says, I have a friend I think you might want to meet. And he introduces her to James Madison and Dolly, the Yellow Fever Survivor becomes Dolly Madison. Um, anyway, that is neither here nor there, but when I found that, I just I couldn't resist it. Um, by late October, it's beginning to ease up. And by November, Washington is wondering whether they can really convene the Congress or not. But by November, it has calmed down enough so that eventually the Congress does come back um, Thomas Spoilston goes back to the city. He writes to John and Abigail and tells them, yeah, it's okay to come back now. And uh, they return. Um, but John is obviously not done with the, uh, with the yellow fever yet because it will keep coming back during his presidency. So in 1797, the first year of his presidency, he is uh, writing uh, from here in Quincy in the late summer into the fall uh, to people like Secretary of State Pickering and to Secretary of the Treasury Walcott asking, uh, can we come back? Is, it gonna, is this going to work? Can we convene Congress uh, or not this fall in Philadelphia? Uh, do we need to try and find some other arrangement? Eventually, the disease uh, is not severe enough and calms down enough that he is able to do so. But in his first message to Congress as president, um, Adams actually begins by saying, I thought we might not be able to meet here in Philadelphia. Um, and he has to do this again in 1798 and uh, in 1799, again, ask, um, is it safe to come back? In 1799, in fact, um, they do actually meet for a while and hold the government in Trenton, New Jersey, rather than in Philadelphia, because the disease is bad enough. But it's really in the time after he's uh, president. It, it's when he's back here in Quincy, sort of um, thinking about his life and uh, to some people would say sort of stewing over some of the things in his life that he um, he says the most about yellow fever in letters to uh, people who, with whom he has experienced it. Uh, he writes, for instance, to Benjamin Rush uh, at um, various times in the early 1800s. Rush is, by the way, publishing a great deal, trying to defend his theory of the disease and his theory of treatment. So uh, in 1805, Adams actually, in a letter to Rush, um, says, I'm fully convinced that the yellow fever sometimes and, is, and indeed often is generated in many places in America, especially in our great cities, are natural causes of putrefaction. So he is supporting 
Russia's theory of the origin. But he can, but he qualifies and he says, but I'm not yet quite clear that it is not contagious or that it might not frequently be imported. I am for cleansing the cities of with all possible industry and at the same time for maintaining quarantine mowers to keep it out from abroad. Um, and then he says, but of course, I don't really, you know, I'm not a medical man, so you know better than I do. Interestingly enough, he's been talking to, in the just before this in the letter, he's been writing to Rush about um, the French and the French Revolution and Napoleon Bonaparte and things like that. And that connection with um, the French and yellow fever seems to keep coming up in his uh, in his writing about it. Uh, keep in mind that uh, in addition to arguments about the nature of yellow fever, there's been a really vigorous political argument going on since 1793 and maybe even a little bit before that between the pro-English Federalists and the uh, pro-French Jeffersonian uh, Democrat Republicans. Um, and um, that neither side really aligns with the theory of the disease or the theory of the treatment of the disease. But those political arguments keep coming back up uh, and kind of shading how people see uh, see the disease itself. Um, <coughs> Adams, <coughs> excuse me, when he, uh, in what is perhaps not John Adams' finest moment, uh, you know, we maybe don't remember quite as much as we used to that there was, there could be a kind of, uh, nasty side to Adams. In another letter, a couple of years later to Rush, he um, is saying, well, you know, I'm not a vindictive man. I, I, I don't hold grudges. And then he begins to list everything bad that happened to everybody, whoever, uh, you know, did him dirt. Um, he's, and several of them he singles out because the yellow fever has gotten them. He mentions a Mr. Greenleaf, a printer of a Jacobin paper in New York who filled his columns for years with libelous paragraphs against me. He was at length carried off by the yellow fever. Um, Benjamin Bates, uh, in revenge for Washington's neglect of his father and his family, was converted from a zealous Federalist to an abandoned Jacobin and became, of course, the most malicious libelers of me. But the yellow fever also arrested him in his detestable career and sent him to his grandfather, from whom he invented a, inherited a dirty, envious, jealous, and revengeful spite against me. And there's uh, yet a third one there, uh, that he uses. Um, he also mentions to Rush in 1807 that the yellow fever just seems to be going on forever. He's, he sympathizes with Rush that he doesn't, that they don't seem to be able to get a handle on it. But the connection with the with the French uh, and the notion of the the disease is somehow caught up as something not just a physical thing, but but a, a moral th uh, quality to it keeps coming up. And the most remarkable uh, one is a letter he writes to Thomas Jefferson, of all people, in 1813, when they're discussing the French Revolution and what's happened to the French Revolution and Bonaparte and all of that and other cases of uh, terrorism. Uh, and he says to Jefferson, you certainly never felt the terrorism ex excited by Genet in 1793 when 10,000 people in the streets of Philadelphia day after day threatened to drag Washington out of his house and effect a revolution in the government or compel it to declare war in favor of the French Revolution and against England. The coolest and finest minds, even among the Quakers in Philadelphia, have given their opinions to me that nothing but the yellow fever, which removed Dr. Hutchinson and Don Jonathan Dickinson Sargent from this world, could have saved the United States from a total revolution of government. Um, the foremost historian of the Philadelphia epidemic said, uh, Adams there is overstating the case as he is wont to do at times. Uh, but Adams is seeing, uh, I wouldn't say the fever as a deliverer, although he, in fact that is what he is saying at the moment. Um, and that political tension it seems to color a lot of the early, um, the early views of the, of the fever and the epidemic 
most notably in the first literary works, uh, which are by uh, this gentleman. Um, this is a picture of Charles Brockton Brown. Um, I don't know how many people have heard of Charles Brockton Brown. If you were an English major, there's a good chance that you did hear of him. And there's even a fair chance that you've probably read one of his novels. He is really the first uh, person in America to try and earn his living as a writer. And he turned out in the space of about really two or three years, six or seven novels that he was writing uh, simultaneously um, with one another. Um, in the period, actually, at the end of Adams's presidency, he is publishing these books, or at least begins publishing them, while Adams is in office in 1799 and 1800. Um, he is a Philadelphian. He was in Philadelphia during the initial days of the, um, the epidemic uh, in 1793, before he went to New York, where the epidemic was milder to pursue uh, literary efforts. He moved in a more radical pro-French circle. He was um, much more of a, of a uh, Democrat Republican, maybe even more radical than that. He was uh, kind of a proto-feminist. He was very interested in the English writer Mary Wollstonecraft and the vindica her vindication of the rights of women. He was interested in the radical theories of William Godwin, the English writer. And his novels really, uh, particularly his first novel, uh, or the first novel we're going to talk about, really try to imitate, uh, try and imitate Godwin uh, in uh, using the novel as a way to kind of try and convey political and, and social ideas. So um, he's a serious novelist. He's a novelist that was taken seriously. Uh, many of the early American writers did know and uh, admire him. He is a little bit tough to take nowadays. Um, there are people who think he's terrific. There are people who find him really maybe um, more than they want to handle, but there is an undoubted power to his to his writing and in at least two of those novels written almost contemporaneously with events he deals with the epidemic of 1793 the first is uh the book ormond uh or the secret witness you'll notice in this 1811 edition they got his initials in the wrong order over there in england where this uh this uh title page uh came from um ormond is the book that is most directly imitating uh, Godwin. It's, it's a novel like a lot of English novels in which there is a heroine who is being beset by misfortunes and by um, men whose intentions are not entirely noble. But um, the heroine of this novel, Constance Dudley, um, really kind of kicks ass, basically. I mean, she, unlike... Uh, Clarissa, uh, Richardson's Clarissa, who, you know, dies uh, when she, or uh, his Pamela, who winds up getting the guy to marry her, uh, she tends to stand her ground. Uh, the story involves, um, she and her father have uh, fallen from middle-class life uh, to poverty because they have been betrayed by a uh, unscrupulous uh, assistant to the father who the father has run an apothecary sh uh, shop in, in Manhattan and he's been bankrupted by this guy who's run off with all the money um, and they've gone to Philadelphia where they're living in abject uh, you know hand-to-mouth kind of poverty in the poor sections uh, when the fever hits. Uh, one of the things that we should say about Brown is that he is he is obsessed with this notion of of something that becomes a real motif in American literature, particularly American literature of the 19th and early 20th century, the, per the character who is not what he seems, uh, the person who pretends to be somebody else who adopts a false identity, the person who is somehow a con man, the person who is um, a, a masquerader of one kind or another. And Ormond, the title character, is exactly that kind of person, as is the person who has betrayed Constance's father. Um, all of this in Ormond is working towards the, uh, towards a sort of economic criticism in which um, the rich are exploiting the poor, having been forced into poverty. Uh, Constance now has to, to deal with the, with the effects of poverty. And as the uh, epidemic strikes, she really experiences it um, 
initially as um, both a, a tragedy, but also as a um, as an economic uh, experience. Uh, her father says to her as they begin, the, she learns about it really because she is trying. She has to take the rent to the landlord, um, and when she gets to the landlord's house, she's told the landlord has died of yellow fever. Um, from that point, it begins. You know, the, the fever begins to close in on them as it spreads through Philadelphia. Her father says, "For the rich, the entire world is an almshouse. They can run anywhere, but we can run nowhere." And that becomes kind of the theme, and the treatment of the disease, unlike uh, the next novel we're going to talk about, is very realistic. Uh, Constance goes to the the neighbors next door. Um, they haven't been seen for a day or so. It's a brother and a sister. She goes next door. The brother has died. The sister is um, the sister is dying. Uh, she cares for the sister. Uh, he very realistically picks up on some of the things that have been um, we've talked about already in the objective uh, reality of, of Philadelphia. The, the belief that the French are somehow immune. Um, the sister eventually uh, passes away uh, with a great deal of very realistic, which, um, but not over the top description. We will spare it to you because it is quite vivid, but it is really, uh, for 1798, it kind of takes you aback at how uh, graphic he is about the, the details of the disease. And um, Brown does, um, writing in 1799, about 1793, Brown does the Free African Society a, a justice. When um, the, the young woman dies and Constance has now two dead bodies in a house and no money, she goes out, she hears a hearse passing, she goes out into the street and it is in fact, um, the book says two Negroes, but obviously two African Americans who are fulfilling, fulfilling the need that has been uh, set up. And um, she tells them the situation and they behave honorably. They tell her, well, we have, you know, we're carrying a body now, but we'll come back. And in fact, they do. And everything, you know, is done uh, correctly. Uh, it's only about 50 pages of the book. Uh, she goes on to other adventures um, and other problems, but it kind of sets the tone uh, and it, um, it puts a, the radical spin on the epidemic, that the epidemic is another sign of social injustice. There is a man, it's not itself social injustice, but it is, its manifestations are another sign of social injustice. The second novel that he wrote, which he's actually writing at the same time he's writing the first, Arthur Mervyn uh, is quite different. I mean, Brown is often described as a Gothic novelist, and this one really is Gothic. Um, unlike Constance, who is there from the beginning, a, a city girl who is living in the city, Mervyn is the kid from the country. Um, he has a family dispute. Uh, he's a farm boy. He wanders into Philadelphia. He's the innocent in the city. He's the forerunner of any number of other innocents in the city. Um, uh, the, the forerunner of Robin Molyneux and Hawthorne's Tale, the forerunner of anybody who comes to the city and gets snookered in any number of American stories. And of course, he arrives in the city and he gets snookered. Um, again, the, uh, but the novel opens actually with the fever. The narr Brown also loves layers of narrators, narrators upon narrators and narrators and stories within stories within stories. So the outermost narrator actually finds Arthur dying of yellow fever on his doorstep. It takes us about, I think, 200 pages to find out that the outer, outermost narrator is a, is a physician, and that is why he has stayed in Philadelphia. But again, Brown is making the ideological points of supporting the people that stayed, the people who did not panic. Um, and he nurses Mervyn back to health, and then Mervyn tells this story that I'm not even, even, not even going to attempt to summarize because I don't think I could. Um, in which he, is, he, he is, uh, falls victim, not only to a first dissembler, but he falls victim to a master manipulator named Welbeck, who gets him into all sorts of complications. But then uh, he actually leaves the city uh, and then um, is back living in the country with another family. And as the epidemic uh, breaks out, 
the boyfriend of one of the daughters of the family that Arthur is living with doesn't come back from Philadelphia. So noble Arthur goes off into the city a second time, even knowing that it's being overrun with the epidemic. And you get um, this kind of deliberate juxtaposition of Arthur arriving the first time into this bustling city that he is not fit, not apt, not capable of, of dealing with yet as the outside innocent. And, and Arthur now coming back to a haunted city, all the images are, uh, Brown uses words like ghostly. Um, he, uh, every time he enters a house, it's like the classic scene of entering the haunted house and going up the stairs, not knowing what you're gonna find. He, he never sees people directly. He sees them in the mirror. They always appear uh, like apparitions. Um, when he finally finds the boy, the missing boyfriend, who by this time he is convinced is dead, he, for a moment, believes he's actually looking at the, uh, the reanimated corpse because the guy is wasted with the yellow fever. Uh, both novels take uh, a number of the of the actual incidents that took place of people trying to flee the city uh, to uh, to escape and uh, getting sick and dying by the way wayside and being being neglected by. Uh, people in the countryside for fear. Um, and um, essentially, as the fever abates, Brown goes on to, to more complications as the, as the stories uh, go on and, and really end, almost endless complications. Even by the time we get to the end of the book at page 400, it looks as though uh, Brown was planning yet another sequel because he leaves at, at you're never quite sure with Brown whether this is deliberate or whether he just was writing so fast he didn't tie up all his ends. But there's certainly a teaser that something else is going to happen right at the end of the novel. Um, so in this one, um, it's still economic. It's still kind of radical politics or radical sociology. But it also has a kind of nightmarish quality that um, we're going to see at other times and in uh, later works. Um, before we leave Philadelphia, I, 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 that was a long time. Alexandra, do you want to say anything? Um, so sort of my last thing that I've come across in terms of the, um, 1793 epidemic is that, um, and sort of tying up uh, a little, tying into what you've been saying as well is that it, it, you know, it also incorporated into a lot of the conversation, semi-political conversation that was going on in America at the time about um, whether or not urban living was even a good idea right? and whether America yeah. really even should be, in America, should have ur big urban centers. And um, I think it was Jefferson actually does talk about this to a certain extent that, well, the yellow fever of in, in Philadelphia is a perfect example of why it's not a great idea. And then as time goes on, um, especially as Philadelphia is recovering from um, the, the series of epidemics that it has in the 1790s, and they start to incorporate um, all of these new um, infrastructures, uh, in, for example, um, the new waterworks and incorporating a modern sort of um, water, water delivery system to a system of pumps instead of having you know, cisterns throughout the city. Uh, this really does start to uh, mitigate, you know, future pandemic or future epidemics of yellow fever and really does start to uh, make the case that, oh, yeah, no, America can have urban centers and, and quite large ones as well. Yes. OK, we're going to uh, move on to New Orleans and we will move more quickly. We spoke, we wanted to spend a lot of time in Philadelphia because it is sort of the, the seedbed of a lot of stuff and also because of uh, the, the connection to the Adams family, uh, but we'll, we're going to move on, and uh, we want to get to uh, to the movies uh, fairly quickly. So we're going to look at New Orleans, and then we're going to look at Cuba uh, briefly. But in, as we look at New Orleans, I do want to uh, bring your attention to a really remarkable novel that I think is unjustly neglected, uh, and we'll get to that very quickly, and we'll kind of do the history of the New Orleans epidemics a little bit more quickly. Um, Recurrent epidemics of yellow fever in New Orleans, as you would expect, given its location, given its low position, given the swamps all around it. Um, 1853 was by far the worst in, this, in a city that was probably a little bit over 100,000, at least eight people, at least 8,000 people died that summer. 
Um, and again, you know, a lot of the kind of woodcut graphics from uh, from broadsides and penny handies, uh, penny magazines you see here of the desolate family, the family just, you know, totally wiped out um, in the picture. Um, there was a second academic epidemic in 1878. This is a picture from Frank Leslie's magazine showing how deserted the main Canal Street in downtown New Orleans is in 1878. That epidemic, by the way, uh, was very widespread and actually hit all the way up the Mississippi River Valley. Memphis was, was really, really badly hit um, by that 1878 epidemic. And in the wake of that 1878 epidemic, um, a, Louisi a native Louisianan and a, a, new, a Louisianan writer uh, George Washington Cable, who um, I meant to double check this, but I believe this is accurate. Cable actually had his own loss in the 1878 epidemic. I believe both a sibling and one of his children uh, died in the 1878 epidemic. He turned to writing a novel that really um, draws, but in a very different way than Brown on that kind of experience. He, um, Cable was a born native-born Louisiana, native-born New Orleans uh, man, but his parents were outsiders. His parents had moved in from outside of Louisiana. They moved in from somewhat more northern climes. He is also, um, because of that, he is uh, a northern European. He is not um, a Creole, although he will wind up writing about the Creoles. He began as a loyal son of the South, and he served in the Confederate Army during the war, but at, during Reconstruction, and particularly in post-Reconstruction, as he saw things begin to go bad, he changed his sympathies and he began to argue uh, against the Redemptionists. He began to argue against um, Jim Crow uh, and began to make that his, um, the subject of his stories. He particularly focused on the Creole culture in New Orleans. Uh, Creole, in this case, embracing a wide range of basically all the European or partially European people who were there before the annexation by the United States. So that, and um, he was particularly interested in the levels of those uh, of within the Creole culture between the all white Creole, the, for want of a better word, I guess you'd have to say mixed race Creole, the, the Creoles who were, potentially partially African and partially European or partially Native American, partially European, uh, the predominantly um, African uh, Creole, and then below that, the people who would not be considered Creole, which would be the purely African American slave. But he works all this into what I think is really a remarkable novel that he published in 1880. So he was writing this during the 1878 epidemic called The Grandesine by George Washington Cable. Now this novel was this is the an 18, uh, what is this? Eight, uh, somebody can do the Roman numerals. This is 1897. Uh, so it's 17 years later. And it's still getting a, a deluxe edition from Scribner's. Um, this was a very popular novel. He was a very influential writer in his time and for a long time afterwards. And he's, he's just kind of vanished from people's consciousness, but he is a, he is a good writer. This is a historical romance with uh, all sorts of levels to it. It takes place, the main story takes place during the period when uh, Louisiana is being acquired by the United States from France. And so New Orleans is transitioning from being um, a colony into being a territory of the United States. And the Creoles are suddenly finding the new Americans coming in, but it is really about all the levels and all the backstory and all the distortions that come from a slave society. Um, there are essentially three or four major characters. There is the outsider, Joseph Frohenfeld, who arrives from the outside, who is an American of German, first, first generation American, second generation American of German heritage, uh, who is the outsider who can comment on the whole thing and then there are the great families that have been feuding for generations, the Grandissime, the, uh, I'm going to forget how to pronounce this name if I don't look it up, the, uh, I've got it here someplace, the, I knew I would go, the De, De Grappin, the Fusilier, 
and then the yeah the de, de, de Grappin, so three families uh, but it's not just three families because then there are levels of who's white in the family who's illegitimate and and partially white and the whole thing just keeps getting more and more complicated yellow fever turns up very subtly unlike um brown who throws it in your face it's a romantic novel um so one of the things that happened in in new orleans was that there was a great deal of native um immunity and newcomers did get it so froenfeld the newcomer who arrives with his entire family falls ill he and his entire family fall ill in the first 25 pages of the novel and he is the only one who survives and so he's sort of left on his own, uh, making his way and becoming friends with, all, with this whole Creole society. Um, it's romantic. Uh, these are illustrations from the 1897 edition. Um, these are the classic romantic setup. Two members, uh, they're at a masquerade ball. Where el what else would you be doing in New Orleans? Uh, and they're unmasking. She is a de Grappin. He is a grand decime, and they don't know that about each other. So they're going to fall in love, and it's going to take 400 pages to work it out. Um, but that's the most, in some ways, trivial aspect of the novel. But it, it's the engine that keeps it going. And in the midst of all this kind of lush romanticism that you can see in this, it winds up telling a very powerful uh, story. At the core of it, you keep hearing about a character named Brock Coupe. Um, and finally, right at the dead center of the novel, Brock Coupe is dead when the novel begins. We know he's been dead. Uh, there are allusions to him. And finally, uh, Frauenfeld gets somebody to tell him the story at the same time that it's being told in two other places, the story of Brock Coupe. This is the illustration for the story of Brock Coupe. Brock Coupe um, is, the story is, uh, it takes place seven years earlier, which is very carefully placed because that puts it back in another fever epidemic year. Brock Coupe is a recently captured African. He is an African prince who has been captured. He's gone through the Middle Passage. It is one of the most sarcastic, uh, sa grimly satirical descriptions of the Middle Passage you will find anywhere. Um, he is brought and he is sold into the, um, into the Grandissime family and then sold off to a, uh, a soon-to-be are given off to a soon to be in law of the grand scenes. And because he is a prince and believes he has been captured in war, he refuses, he is willing to accept his capture, but refuses to work. Um, he is then involved with one of the, another fascinating character, a slave woman named Palmyre, who uh, he is brought into. It becomes very complicated. Eventually, uh, the plan is that he and Palmyre will marry, and there's the hope that this will bring him back into the, into the uh, set. Everything goes wrong at the, at, at, the, um, at the proposed wedding and he escapes. And this is the scene where he escapes and he escapes into the, uh, into the mangroves and into the swamps. Um, he's been dressed patronizingly in leftover, you know, pomp and circumstance military gear. So the illustration sort of suggests both the strengths and the weaknesses of it. I mean, it's, uh, it's powerful and yet it's also somewhat uh, patronizing. Uh, Cable recognizes the patronization but can't quite escape it, but winds up still with a, a remarkable, powerful thing. And without trying to tell you the whole thing, um, Coupe curses the family and the curse takes the manifestation of the yellow fever. Uh, he is eventually captured and in a horrifying moment, really, uh, uh, is hamstrung. You, you really hear what hamstrung means, which is obviously the cutting of the tendons so that you can no longer support yourself on your legs. Um, the curse continues at the last moment in his dying breath, uh, presented with the child of the dead, of his dead enemy. He forgives the curse, which is the scene you see here. This is not giving away anything of the story. Uh, this is a very hard novel to find, but I really recommend it to anybody, um, it, I found it an absolute revelation and uh, I made Alexandra read some of it. So I don't know what she thought about it, but uh, what did you think? Um, I did not read the entire thing. Uh, I will preface this with that. I only read uh, and specifically made me read the the story of Brock Coupe. Um, and it's, it's definitely very graphic. Um, it has 
quite a lot of um, very interesting, very, very Victorian themes in it. Um, it has the sort of uh, Bracupe being the, the emblem of the noble savage. So he's, he's treated as the protagonist. He's clearly the person that you're supposed to be rooting for to a certain extent. But at the same time, he's, he's not, there's a very clear, his customs are looked down upon, his way of doing things is looked down upon, and he's not exactly treated as a fully fledged character in a way that you would expect from a novel from this period. But I, I would just, you know, the point I suppose I should make is that this is, even though it's done most subtly, this is the most explicit, uh, this very clearly mm -hmm. makes the connection that the fever uh, and slavery are linked, that in some way, you know, symbolically, the fever is a punishment for the sin of slavery. Uh, I think, you know, that, that, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to move fast into Cuba. Uh, this is, I think everybody actually knows this part of the story, or, or at least some of the parts of it. This is Major Walter Reed of the U.S. Army Medical Corps. Um, after the Spanish-American War, which the United States won in 1898, uh, this, the United States took temporary occupation of Cuba. Uh, Reed was sent as the head of a team of doctors uh, to try and get a handle on what yellow fever is because yellow fever and how to, what could be done about it because yellow fever is endemic in Cuba. Um, there, the other members of his uh, team were Jesse Lazier, James Carroll, and uh, a local guy, Aristides Agramonte, who was a Cuban. Um, they are pursuing the mosquito idea, the idea that it is born by mosquitoes. They do not originate that idea. The idea has been kicking around for a while, for a while is most earnestly advocated by this gentleman, Dr. Carlos Finlay, who lives, who's lived his entire life in Cuba, uh, but is Scottish by uh, ethnicity and, and heritage. His parents came from Scotland. He is still alive and he is assisting them um, in, uh, they, Reed gets there in July, June of 1900. They certainly interview Finlay sometime in July of 1900. Um, by the late July of 1900, they are convinced that the they think the mosquito theory is correct, but the final complication to uh, yellow fever is that most animals can't get it. So they conclude, the four scientists, the four doctors conclude that they are willing to experiment on humans, including themselves, to see if they can induce yellow fever from mosquito bites and only mosquito bites. And at the same time, prove that it is not transmitted by other means such as uh, soiled bed clothing from a, from a fever victim and things like that. Um, at that point, Reed has to return to Washington because he is also on a typhoid commission and has to be there to write the final report for that commission. Carol and um, Lazare begin fooling around, begin working with mosquitoes that um, Finlay has given them and um, Lazier, Carol doesn't really believe it unless the mosquito bite him and gets sick. Lazier does believe it unless the mosquito bite him and does get sick. Lazier dies before Reed gets back. At that point, they decide that they have to do this in a more, Reed decides that they have to do this in a much more uh, consistent way. And that is when they are for volunteers from the United States troops that is there, plus Cuban volunteers, they set up a controlled experiment and uh, by the end of 1900, uh, by infecting some men and by having other men exposed to the uh, infected bedclothes, uh, are able to demonstrate basically all the salient points of the mosquito transmission. Uh, and with that, we are able to control mosquitoes and build the Panama Canal under William Gorgas. And that's a picture of beginning in 1906. And we are fumigating the last uh, epidemic in New Orleans in 1905. But it isn't completely over because it passes into our memory, most notably in the 1938 film um, Jezebel, directed by William Wyler. 
Um, it is a movie that uses that 1853 epidemic. It's not done, unlike Cable, nobody involved with this is a native Louisiana, and most of, nobody's really even a native Southerner. Um, but it is um, a remarkable movie in that it takes the yellow fever and the story and makes it not only sort of a symbol for its time, uh, but also a symbol for the time in which the movie is made for the 1930s. Uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of emphasis on reconciliation with the South in the 1930s movies because partly from the depression, partly from the need to, uh, the recognition that we are possibly heading towards the second world war. So the attempt to unify. Jezebel is subtly, subtly critical of the South. And it also of course gives um, Betty Davis a chance for a wonderful uh, Academy Award winning performance. So we're gonna look at those two, two clips of that real fast. And hopefully this is gonna work. Uh, keep in mind, this is a black and white film. The plot turns on the fact that she is going to want to wear a red dress to the ball. You're going to see her make the decision, and then we're going to see her at the ball. Watch how um, a black and white film manages to make the center of your attention a red dress whose color you can't see. Bring that over here. Saucy, isn't it? And vulgar. Yes, isn't it? Come on, get me out of this. Julie, what are you doing? If it fits me, I'm going to wear it to the Olympus Bowl. A red dress to the Olympus Bowl while you're out of your senses. Mademoiselle, jeune fille porte une robe comme ça. D'ailleurs, c'est une robe de cette Marie Vicaire. That creature, Julie. You heard what Madame Poulain said. That infamous Vickers woman. Mary Vickers couldn't possibly do it justice. Child, you're out of your mind. You know you can't wear red to the Olympus Ball. Can't I? I'm going to. This is 1852, Dumplin. 1852, not the Dark Ages. Girls don't have to simper around in white just because they're not married. In New Orleans, they do. Julie, you'd insult every woman on the floor. Mademoiselle, your aunt, she's right. Look how beautiful this dress is. Will you kindly get me out of this? Julie, you can't be serious. Never more serious in my life. But Julie, think of press. That's just exactly what I am thinking of. So the idea is she's going to break the code, wear red to the ball, put Fonda in a precarious position. It's She's a woman who has more ability and more strength than the society knows what to do with her for and it keeps coming out in these kind of perverse ways so the next scene is what happens at the ball Gentlemen, you all have the privilege of Miss Martin's acquaintance, I think. Gentlemen, Miss Martin, Martin. respects, man. Good, Good evening, man. Buck. Uh, we were just fixing to pour us a little libation. That's right. Shall we see you later? Excuse me. Oh, there's my partner now. Uh, excuse me, please. You have no partner you have to meet, Cantrell. I know. Came alone. Pleasant evening, isn't it? Mighty pleasant. Nice and cool. Do you find it cool in here? I don't find it particularly cool. Do you, Julie? I, I know. I don't find it particularly cool. Miss Julie doesn't find it so. 
I know. Now you speak of it, it's just about right. Seems so to me. Your servant. Yours, Miss Julie. Price, I want to leave. We haven't danced yet. Shall we? No. What I'm going to do, just in the interest of time, is I'm going to make two more points about Jezebel quickly with these two stills, and then finish up. We've only got we've got just two or three slides after that, and I'll, I'll go quickly through it, and then we'll come back to Jezebel because there are a number of things I think uh, Alexander would like to say. I'm, we'll just maybe see if we can get some time on it. Um, one of the things that it under the movie undercuts is the stereotype of the 1930s stereotype of the black slave or the black servant. Um, it Overtly, it uses the stereotypes, but it uh, continually undercuts them. Most notably in this scene, Fonda has gone to, has spent a year in the North. He comes back. This is Uncle Cato, the, the trusted long, lifelong black butler at, uh, at Julie's uh, mansion. Uh, the, the white people are being served. Welcome back, mint juleps. Um, there were just the two of them in the room at the time, and Fonda asks the butler to join him in a drink, which the butler won't actually drink with him, but says, yes, he'll take it back. The second um, is its treatment of yellow fever. This is a scene of the, of the yellow fever. The yellow fever is introduced early in the movie, and it's kind of hovering in the background. The yellow fever and violence move together in the movie, and what you don't see necessarily coming, but they, they meet towards the end of the movie. There, there's violence in the society and the yellow fever is lurking around the edges and eventually it's like a, like a vector. Um, and they, they come together um, at the two thirds point of the movie. Um, less classily than the Grand seems, but quite effectively, the fever is the, again, the symbol of the lack of change, the distorted, corrupt society, um, but, you know, done in a way that you don't quite, you, you don't have to see it if you don't want to see it if you're looking at the movie, but but it's there. And I'd love to be, if we have got a little time, I'd love to be able to come back and talk about that some more. The last two things to talk about, this, um, we could spend another time, some other time doing this, but it's, culturally, it's, the artifacts are the least interesting, although it's a culturally interesting thing. This is a celebratory mural, uh, almost like a, you know, a kind of heroic pageant, something like you would have seen, like one of those scenes of the fictive pictures of them signing the Declaration of Independence. This is Walter Reed conquering uh, yellow fever, done around 1940. There's Reed, and there's the guy getting the mosquito, and you got 25 people sitting around watching this guy get a mosquito bite. Um, in addition to art like this, uh, there is a play and a movie called Yellow Jack. Yellow Jack is the nickname of the fever. comes from the yellow flag that ships would uh, sail, raise the warning flag if there was yellow fever on board. Um, a somewhat successful Broadway play and a reasonably successful 1938 movie, same year as Jezebel, about, you know, with a very romantic, heroic depiction of uh, Reed and the enlisted soldiers that volunteer, literally conquering yellow fever. It also, that play gets done three different times on live TV in the great era of live TV of the 1950s. So at that stage from 1930 to 1950, we move from this kind of fatalistic or, or this guilt or to this kind of triumphalist notion about yellow fever that uh, we've conquered it. And uh, obviously, it's allowed us to build the Panama Canal. It's allowed us to become an international power that we've conquered it. It's allowed us to go into the warm places of the world. And you can draw your own implications about that and why that maybe didn't last past 1960. Um, and of course, that doesn't last. I, I found We found very late uh, something that I wasn't aware of. This is John Edgar Wideman, um, still quite alive at age 80. 
Um, he is <coughs> a very distinguished African-American writer, <coughs> a Philadelphia native, Philadelphia in a city kid who got to go to the University of Pennsylvania, uh, was until very recently a professor at Brown, um, and a prodigious novelist and short story writer. In 1989, he made a story about the yellow fever epidemic of 1793 and those black volunteers, the title story of his short story collection, all of which revolved around Philadelphia themes. And um, it wouldn't even do this story justice to try. He's a very experimental writer. He's a very modernistic writer. Uh, so he's difficult to excerpt and it really wouldn't do him justice to do it. But some, it, you move through multiple voices, uh, times shift, um, the, but suddenly you have that story of those black volunteers from, from a black perspective in 1989. So we've kind of come full circle, but we've kind of come out at another place. Um, and um, still, in some way, uh, the fever and the complexities of the American past remain uh, connected. Okay, so uh, Alexandra, sorry I ran through all that, but what what would you like to add? Um, so uh, pitching back, I guess, to, um, um, to Jezebel a little bit and sort of get, having my five-minute soapbox while we still have a couple yep. more minutes here. Yep. Um, just to be able to sort of make a pitch for everybody to go and watch that movie because um, it is it is very interesting. Um, it's very much at its core that sort of very stereotypical southern melodrama, you know, a la uh, Gone with the Wind, but it has a lot to say, a surprising amount to say. Um, I saw it for the first time about a week ago. And I keep on turning scenes over in my head. I keep on going back to it in, in my mind and just thinking things over. First of all, um, Betty Davis gives a phenomenal performance. I mean, she did win an Academy Award for it, so you can imagine that. But, um, and then, but Julie, the character that she's playing, just really is so interesting. Um, interesting in a way that you don't really see many female characters portrayed in movies today. Um, she, you, you never really know what to think about her when she's first introduced. She is uh, immensely lovable and you're, and she's like, oh wow, she's great. And then just, she does some really horrible things over the course of the movie. So you're not quite sure what to think about her. Um, and then by the end, you're right back right around again. Um, so she really is a very, very, and Julie is a very, very interesting character. In fact, um, Betty Davis in one of the promotional videos or promotional um, pieces for the movie describes Julie as uh, she's the belle of New Orleans, a very headstrong girl who has no regard for, con for conventions and she can be the meanest girl in the world one min moment and the most lovable the next. And she makes plenty of trouble for any man brave enough to fall in love with her. And that's a really good summary of, of Julie as a character. And it just in terms of the rest of the movie, the way that they um, sort of have um, yellow fever throughout the entire thing and just sort of building and the tent building and building and building the tension is very well done. Um, and I, and the director has a really phenomenal ability to pack every single scene with all these little details that you're not going to notice on the first go around, but you just, you, you could watch it five or six times and probably notice something different each time. Um, you, could, you could actually dem demonstrate that uh, right now. Watch the Black Maid. First person to actually see the dress is the maid, the black woman who actually takes off her her jacket and who, and she's the first one to react um, with some consternation about, Oh my God, that's a red dress. What are you doing? Um, and so it really, and it's the kind of thing that if you're looking at um, Betty Davis and, and uh, Fonda in that scene, you're not, you're going to miss it. 
Um, but it, yet at the same time, she's perfectly in focus. And so if you're looking for it, you can see her. Uh, so there's lots of just little details like that, which are very well done. And um, I will say, uh, without giving away the ending, um, it is ambiguous what the ending actually is um, and, ha and what actually happens to the characters. Um, so just as a warning for anyone who doesn't like that kind of movie where you don't, you have to kind of think about it. Um, if that's not your cup of tea, then maybe give this one a miss, but I, I quite enjoy that myself. So, um, I, I quite liked it, but it, it, it end Julie, Julie's story has come to an ending to a natural ending, even though you're not quite sure what happens. Um, yeah, we might just uh, one last credit on this. And I know we're running very late. Um, the, the, John Huston, who was one of the great movie ironists of all time, ironists of all time, had a hand in the screenplay. And I think that shows up in all sorts of ways in here that we could spend another hour talking about. But go ahead. Um, OK, Clint, we'll, we'll stop talking. Honest, really. So, yeah, I think um, we're ready for questions if anybody has them at this point, if we still if we still have time for questions at this point. Great. There have been a couple of questions. Um, the first question, and, and I should encourage people at this point, if you think of additional questions as I'm talking or have been holding your questions here until the end, please use the chat streams to communicate them to me or, or do it on YouTube or on Facebook. Um, the first question came pretty early on, was you just trying to understand the mechanics of the yellow fever and how it kept coming back every summer. Um, were the mosquitoes basically holding it over the winter uh, no. or how did, why, how did it work? No, that seems the the um, sort of the best. If anybody wants to read about this, there's a book called Yellow Jack. It's not the, the Yellow Jack I was talking about, not the movie. There's a book called Yellow Jack that's written by a guy who was actually a, 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 a doctor at Walter Reed uh, for a, a long time. And it, it kind of goes over that. No, it, the assumption is that you have to keep getting fresh recruits. Somebody has to be coming in, carrying the disease, and being carrying the disease at that moment in time when he will it will work for the mosquito to bite him and and it will be viable. So yes, the people who said it was the, the people coming in on the boats in Philadelphia were right. Uh, uh, it, that otherwise, yes, it would. If you don't get that, then it dies out. Yeah. And so it would basically die every winter because yeah. people who would get it would die, You're and right. then somebody new would bring in, and then mosquitoes would bite that person, and then. Yeah. Right. In, in fact, and um, whenever there would be an epidemic occurring, uh, usually it would last through the warmer months. And then as soon as there was a hard frost in, you know, late October, early November, that is when you would really see the, the number of cases die down when the mosquitoes die. Wow. So another question. So we went from 1793 to 1853, but we were in Philadelphia when we last met in public, we were talking about the influenza of 1918. Um, so I guess I, oh, I, was, I, was, I was getting confused. So did Philadelphia, like I, I just remember in, when we were talking about Philadelphia that um, the mosquitoes or that, the, that they, they basically let people out too early and they had that big march um, in Philadelphia and a whole bunch of people got sick with influenza after that. Yeah. Was there any lessons learned? Do they talk in Philadelphia about lessons that they learned from the yellow fever that then, you know, was, was relevant to the other outbreaks that they suffered? Uh, I, the, the short answer is I don't know. I don't know whether, whether Alexander right. came across it, but I, I think my guess is probably not. Um, the uh, It's almost the other way around because people were scared of stuff happening that because of the nature of the transmission couldn't happen. So, I mean, um, unlike COVID where it's airborne and just if we were all sitting in a room together, we would be at considerable risk just even doing this. Um, with yellow fever, one of us could have it. And as long as no mosquito got into the room, we'd be just hunky dory fine. You know? Okay. Um, yeah, sort of adding on to that a little bit. Yeah, in my research about um, the 1918 pandemic, I did not come across, to be fair, I was not focusing too much 
on Philadelphia. I was more interested in Boston and Massachusetts and Quincy specifically. Um, but I did look a little bit at Philadelphia and I didn't see too much. It, just the ways in which the two diseases are spread are just so completely different. Um, uh, the only real thing that I can think of is that, you know, in, in Philadelphia in 1793, you have some of the same sort of fumbling for, okay, maybe this will work. And it, the same sorts of uh, trial and error in terms of dealing with the outbreak. Like, for example, I found a couple instances of some um, recommendations given uh, by the city to its citizens, and they're warned to avoid fatigue, hot sun, night air, and too much liquor, which is something that was also, to a certain extent, advised um, of uh, influenza patients. But then also, it because it was thought that the, or and very, and especially by Dr. Rush, um, it was thought that the yellow fever was spread through miasma, so foul air. Uh, it was said that you, everybody should be carrying vinegar and camphor oil to like in their handkerchiefs to essentially keep out the um, the bad air. Um, then you also have things such as reducing public gatherings, cl actively cleaning the streets and wharves, um, and then uh, measures such as burning tar and um, exploding gunpowder in order to disturb the air and hopefully disperse the particles. Now, some of those obviously are going to work better than others, um, but it's similar in that it's with something new and something drastic and something really almost apocalyptic feeling, you're going to throw everything at the wall and, and see what sticks. Yeah. And some of those things would have kept the bugs away too. So right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <that's true. laughs> yeah. some of those things do work. Right. Yeah. Right. So I guess the final question is when I was going and looking even for images, when we were talking about this, I, I saw that yellow fever it still exists. There are mosquitoes still carrying, you, know, you could get infected with yellow fever today. So maybe, I don't know if you have anything to say for folks who may be traveling. I don't think it's, we've seen a case of yellow fever in North America in quite some time, but. Not for a very long while. Actually, yeah. the, uh, that, the, the Yellow Jack book, which is, I think came out in the early 2000s, mentions a guy dying in Texas of it, like in the late 1990s. Um, but that he caught it. He, he had been up, he'd been up river someplace in South America on a hunting trip. And so he caught it there and came back with it. Um, there is a book that, um, I don't remember the title. There, there is a history of, in the, of in, written in recent years of the yellow fever epidemic that then, you know, the subtitle is, and how it could strike again. Um, there is no cure. There is a vaccine, but there is no cure. I mean, the, the treatment really wouldn't be too much and it's a virus so and the, the mosquito to... was the mosquito quote coast named i mean it's obviously named for mosquitoes but did it become really feared because of an association between the yellow uh -huh. fever and That's... the mosquitoes there i don't know it could, be. Yeah. It could I, be i would also say not necessarily just yellow fever but also malaria dengue fever these uh, other types of diseases that are also mosquito borne yeah. any a lot of these diseases have a very similar um, history and, and, and um, track record in terms of being feared, although yellow fever had a particular uh, influence on American psyche, as we've been talking about tonight. And was clearly intrinsically linked with um, people coming over from it being brought over enslaved from Africa through the Caribbean. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well. yeah. Well, thank you both very much. I'm sure we can continue. And this is a fascinating topic. And there's obviously a lot more to go into. I'm sure there's a lot more literature. Um, there's, a, I mean, the, the histories of New Orleans and Philadelphia are fascinating. Um, thank you.